Um, before I introduce our speaker, Chalvin, who almost needs no introduction, I am, however, going to say a few words, very brief words, to introduce the Centre for International Law and Globalisation, because this event is not only Chelvin's public lecture here, but it is also the launch event of the Centre, as well as its inaugural lecture. And so it's worth saying a few words about that, especially because you know, I'm aware that we have an audience that is not only members of the law school who might know what we're doing, but it's a wider audience, which is exactly what we wanted for this. So the core aims of the Centre are first, to foster innovative research and policy engagement by experts in a wide range of distinct substantive areas of international law. And that's the academic bit, all right? And the real kind of core academic bit. But secondly, building on that, recognizing that contemporary global challenges, such as displacement of people, environmental degradation, dealing with the consequences of conflict, which are all issues that we have to deal with today. These kinds of issues are multidimensional and engaging, you know, for instance, issues of both human rights and economic consequences of these particular issues and challenges. So global challenges, or wicked problems as they're sometimes known, are also closely interrelated. Arguably, it will not be possible to achieve an end to hunger without tackling climate change. Similarly, we won't be able to end global poverty without tackling climate change, okay, arguably. So the centre provides a space in which researchers with expertise in specific areas can work collaboratively, building and moving forward, cutting across distinct substantive areas to explore law's role and potential contribution in addressing contemporary and international and global challenges. But another dimension that's worth recognising is that the global problems like climate change require us to recognise the contingency and contestability of traditional approaches to international law and governance and to reshape these, basically. So, for example, who are the actors who needs to be involved in decision making and how are they held to account? And these are issues which traditionally in international law, international is all about state, what states can do. But increasingly there's a recognition that to solve global problems, it's not enough that we look to what states can do, but we also need to look to who is involved in the decision making, what kinds of actors, national actors, sure states, but also regional actors, local actors, civil society groups, all need to be involved and engaged in decision making in order to be able to tackle global challenges. And we, may, we need to be willing to question what's meant by concepts like sustainable development and to look at how we can reshape those in order to achieve kind of responses to global challenges. There's a theme here. But such challenges also require approaches that combine and connect the global to the local, all right? And crucially, that recognize the immediate and lived effects of global problems upon individuals. Southampton as a port city has a very obvious contemporary and historic connection with the global and that shapes all of our lives in the city today. But clearly it's not only port cities such as Southampton that the impacts of global challenges are felt. The consequences of conflict such as that in Ukraine or Sudan are and will be felt across continents and across countries including here in Southampton but across the UK as well. Clear, engaged thinking about these kinds of issues, connecting policy making and expertise, and combining both of these with practical experience and application are absolutely key to addressing these challenges at all levels, not only at the global, but also at the local. It's therefore, I'm gonna say finally, with great pleasure that I can turn now to Chelvin, who perfectly manifests this combination of clear thinking, expertise, and practical experience combined with a necessary dose of compassion and empathy to present the inaugural public lecture for the centre. Chelvin's biography, which is in the Eventbrite details, I'm sure you've read them, speaks for itself. Chelvin is a self-proclaimed activist lawyer. He's a leading practitioner in immigration and asylum claims. He has a first class degree from Southampton in politics and law, an LLM from Harvard and a PhD from King's College London as well as decades, yes it is now decades, of experience in courts at all levels up to and including the European Court of Human Rights. All of this combining to lead to a global reputation. I know that this week Chelvin has been juggling watching the Rwanda case in the Court of Appeal with following the illegal immigration bill proceedings in the House of Commons and multiple television appearances. We are therefore very lucky to have 
Chelvin here this evening for this exceptionally timely and challenging for him and important lecture. So, Chelvin. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, uh, Emily, for the lovely uh, introduction. It's quite funny that Alan was saying that the fire drill is that we need to go to the tennis court in case there is a fire alarm. Because I can tell you, watching the Rwanda case since Monday, it's been like watching a tennis match on centre court. And we'll be going through that later on. But I'd like to, first of all, draw a homage and thanks, because it's like coming back home to be here at Southampton. 25 years ago, this July, I graduated here from Southampton. And I look around this room, and there's wonderful faces of, of Dr. Paul Meredith and, and Natalie Lee and Russell Bentley. And these are all lecturers of mine from, from when I was here as a student. And somebody who isn't here is Professor Caroline Thomas, um, who's there in the picture. That's the day I got my uh, exam results on the 28th of June, 1998. Um, I was absolutely over the moon. And um, Caroline, unfortunately, passed away in around 2006-07. Um, and she, you know, activist lawyers, we're only activist lawyers because of the people who are around us, who love and support us and drive us. And even in the darkest times of my student days, Caroline didn't allow me to be miserable or sad. She kept on telling me the, the mantra, you've got so much more to give. Because that's what it's like to being an activist lawyer. We're there to drive social change through the law. And the, the tree behind is actually the tree in the memorial garden in, in the uh, Highbury. Um, so I'd like to dedicate uh, this lecture to Caroline Thomas. So in this short period of time, and being a barrister, I like the sound of my own voice, so we're here for five hours, but I'm going to try in 40 minutes to look at the following themes in relation to my lecture today for the Centre of International Law and Globalisation. I'm going to talk briefly about my journey as an activist lawyer. Then I'm going to give a very short summary of the 1951 Refugee Convention the framework guidance of British-UK jurisprudence regarding refugee cases in the seminal case of H.J. Iran and H.T. Cameroon in 2010. We will then look at the National Borders Act 2022 to say that every waking hour of my life at the moment, my professional or personal life, is about how refugee law is changing in this country minute by minute is an understatement. But the Nationality and Borders Act commenced came into force on the 28th of June 2022, and we already see the UK diverging from its international obligations under the Refugee Convention by creating two strands of refugees, Group 1 and Group 2 refugees. I then will talk about, sorry, discuss the Rwanda Migration Plan and give you a brief summary about what's been happening in the uh, Court of Appeal, including this morning. Lord Panic, on behalf of the Secretary of State, introducing a concept of originalism in relation to what the state party's duties are under the Refugee Convention, which is a huge chilling effect for us in this room regarding refugee protection. I then, I comically call it the illegal, illegal migration bill, uh, because of its non-compliance with human rights uh, measures, including yesterday's vote in the House of Commons, the third reading, 289 votes for, 230 votes against. And then I look at the safe legal routes and broken system. May I also say, to protect my BSB compliance, I'm not here as a barrister speaking to you today. I'm here as an academic. The reason why I'm saying that is that BSB guidance is not to talk about cases which are currently in, in live unless you're referring to them in an academic perspective. <laughs> so let's quickly talk about my role as the activist lawyer. As an advocate, I fully believe in lived experience. So there's little me on the right-hand picture. You see the, the, the cute little four-year-old on the left-hand side, and that's a date stamp. Sorry, you can't see it fully on, on the screen. So I arrived in this country on the 6th of September 1978, just after my fourth birthday. I was born in Sri Lanka as a Tamil, and Tamils in Sri Lanka are a persecuted group. In 1977-78, there were anti-Tamil riots in Colombo. And my mother was already here as an anaesthetist. And my parents decided it wasn't really a safe country to bring up two Tamil boys. So luckily for us, because she was already in the UK, we were able to piggyback her visa to escape what was feared persecution in Sri Lanka. We knew nothing about refugee cases. We didn't know about asylum claims. But my parents wanted us to be safe 
here in the UK. So I am, in effect, a pseudo-refugee. So we came here on the 6th of September 1978. But I self-identify. How do I self-identify? I self-identify as queer, as a person of colour, a first-generation immigrant, a person who lives with disability. I have a hearing impairment in my, my left ear. So I believe in intersectionality. I believe the overlapping of identities. And noting the political scientists in the room, we're not going to talk about agency today. We're talking about identity and how identity spurs us to enable us to represent other people who are marginalised communities. So this is a brief um, summary of my, work, uh, of my life as an activist lawyer. Uh, Southampton taught me to be an academic, an activist, and an advocate. These were the skills my time here at Southampton enabled me to do. You can see the picture of my husband on the, the top right. Uh, we met nearly 22 years ago before there were apps. We actually had to talk to each other on a dance floor. It was his birthday. I won't say anything more. 22 years later. Um, but the work I do is about being visible, being standing up and being proud to be able to say, I am an immigrant. You see the post on, on the bottom left? That's 2015 for the I'm an immigrant poster campaign. So my rationale, the underlying rationale to the work I do is to save lives and change lives. You, you, you can't beat it. You know, to get the thank you card from one of my refugee clients to say thank you for saving my life is priceless. Absolutely priceless. I get stopped in the street by former clients of mine. I think, you know, went to the gym the other week and somebody stopped me in the street and said, Chelman, do you, do you remember me? I said, oh, I'm sorry, really bad memory for faces and names. He said, you represented me in 2009. You know, if not for you, I wouldn't be here. Now, that's pretty remarkable. Um, I always am very lucky to have a symbiotic relationship between, as an activist lawyer, between the academic research, policy development, and litigation. So it's very important to know, as lawyers, that you can advance movements by not just being litigators in the, in the courtroom, but also use your interpersonal skills to be able to advance policy change and academic research. And I'm very lucky that I'm standing here today before you as somebody who next year, and I look at Iona here uh, with Nina, who's not here in the room, uh, LLM in international human rights law and, do, and contributing to a, a module in uh, international refugee law. There are still spaces available, I understand. <laughs> Um, but the, the important thing is that I am living my dream as an activist lawyer. Notwithstanding everything you're hearing about refugees at the moment by our political paymasters, and I should add a footnote, I know Suella Braverman. Suella and I were in chambers together between 2011 and 2015. So I know her personally from that period. Clearly, I'm not going to say anything about our discussions through that period, but she is a politician. And the great thing about the UK with our checks and balances, as the Rwanda case has shown in the past four days, is that whatever the politicians say, we can go into a courtroom before a judge and argue in case to look at the interpretation of the law. And politicians, so far, abide by the judgments of the rule of law. So let's look at the Refugee Convention. Even before the 51 Convention, which we're referring to today, countries of the world realise that we've got to do something to be able to protect people who, fear, who escape, who flee their countries of persecution, to be able to get safety. So in 1933, the first international instrument we can see is the 1933 International Convention on Refugees. Only five countries at that stage, Belgium, Bulgaria, France, Norway and Egypt. And you can see by Article 4, a general consensus that we need to do something to be able to protect people. Of course, we know about what happened in the Holocaust, and here we have uh, a picture in relation to gay men who were targeted and wore the pink triangle in relation to the labour camps they were interned to. But it wasn't the Holocaust which caused the Refugee Convention to be framed, but it was the mass movements of thousands of people across Europe which suddenly said, well, we've got to do something to be able to address this huge migration move uh, in Europe and other parts of the world. So what is a refugee? And noting that we've got a very short period to be able to cover it today. But the definition of a refugee is enshrined in Article 182 of the 1951 Refugee Convention. And it's supplemented by the 1967 Protocol. So let's look at the definition. Owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, 
particular social group, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. So five convention reasons. You have to show your membership of one of those five convention reasons to be starting off your definition of a refugee. And that oh, it is outside the country of a nationality or habitual residence. Please note, the Home Secretary yesterday said on Sky News that the Sudanese who want to come and claim asylum in the UK can do it in the, via the UNHCR. We know that's rubbish, it's nonsense, yeah, because UNHCR basically made it very clear that they can't uh, make, uh, facilitate applications to the UK. But it's the, the key agreement is you have to be outside the country of your nationality. Because if you're inside the country of your nationality or habitual residence, then you can get protection from your country of origin or habitual residence. And importantly, it's unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. Yeah? So that's very important. Now, for me, as a, as a refugee lawyer, the Refugee Convention is a living instrument. And the reason for that is because of looking at the various other articles. So Article 31 of the Refugee Convention is in relation to not imposing any criminal penalties on anybody claiming asylum. So our case law, up to the 2022 Act, the National Nationality and Borders Act, was that you can go through Europe and France and then come to the UK and claim asylum. The leading cases are Edimi in the Divisional Court and Assault on the House of Lords. Because it is subjective. You are fleeing your country of origin because of the fear of persecution. Where does, do you, as a refugee, feel safe? The country of host country of refugee status determination doesn't make that appraisal. It's very much on the subjective. Where do you feel safe? Then we have Article 32, expulsion. That becomes live later on this afternoon when we talk about Article 32 and expulsion. You cannot expel a refugee. Because this is very important. When the individual flees their country of origin, they're automatically a refugee under international law. What the UK does, or what France does, or what America does, or what Canada does, is what is called refugee status determination. It recognises that you're a refugee. That's why the convention talks about the refugee. Because it accepts that you are automatically a refugee once you cross the border of your country of nationality or habitual residence. So note the highlighted section, the expulsion of such a refugee, shall only be in pursuance of a decision reached in accordance with due process of the law. Footnote, Rwanda. Can the UK government say that it is in line with Article 32 of the Convention if and when the UK courts say expelling to Rwanda as a safe country is in accordance with the law? That's where the battlefield will be for the Rwanda case. Article 33, non-reformal. You cannot remove an individual to a country, to their host country, country of origin, if they will face persecution, serious harm, or torture. Yeah, that is very, very important. But look at Rider 2, and this is where the interplay between the Refugee Convention and other international instruments, such as the European Convention of Human Rights, comes into play. You can exclude somebody from refugee status if they've, if they've committed a serious crime. But the safety net for the individual refugee in relation to expulsion, even if they've been excluded under 32, uh, 33 2, is Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights, or Article 2. Because we cannot expel an individual a country where they'll, they'll be killed or suffer torture, inhuman or degrading treatment. The, the um, leading case here, of course, as we know, is Chahal in the Strasbourg Court. So what are the serious, the key components? So the definition of a refugee and persecution, serious harm plus failure of state protection equals persecution. That's a formulaic approach to the refugee definition from James Hathaway, who's one of the leading international uh, jurists uh, and academics in the, f in the field in relation to the definition of persecution. But more importantly, as we said a few moments ago, you're outside the country of nationality or habitual residence. So that involves a physical journey. This is important because of statelessness cases. So it's just the, that's why the 1967 protocol came into place, because of what was happening with the Palestinian territories. I've got a case at the moment in the European Court of Human Rights where I'm representing an Anwar refugee from Lebanon. Yeah? And what we're saying in that case, which is quite interesting, is that Article 1D of the Refugee Convention, which says that if you're from a UN protectorate state, 
uh, we say that that is not in line with Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights because Article 3 of the European, uh, European Convention is forward-looking, where Article 1D is just why did you leave the, the protection of the UNWA mandate. As I said, there are five convention reasons. Reli race, religion, nationality, membership, particular social group, or political opinion. But also note the corollary of the, the five convention reasons is imputed. Perception is key. So a case I, I uh, led on in 2011 called SW Jamaica. Um, if you're a lesbian in Jamaica, even if you're not a lesbian between the ages of 16 and 60, you're supposed to be sexually receptive to a male persecutor. And the only way that you can avoid uh, persecution is that if you're, uh, you've got children, uh, you have a male partner, or you have been recently widowed. And if you don't have any of those key factors to prove straight, you could be perceived to be what they call a sodomite and then have a real risk of curative rape or murder. That is a country guidance case of 2011 called SW Jamaica, still the law. And I, as I said, I believe in intersectionality, so we look at the overlapping of convention reasons. Interestingly, this morning when I was preparing the panel slides, a typical barrister does everything at the last minute, um, I saw on the UNHCR website this other definition, which is quite interesting. What is a refugee? Refugees are people who have been forced to flee their homes and have crossed an international border to find safety in another country. Now, some of you uh, would have heard on mainstream media, oh, refugees are about people who are fleeing war or conflict. Yeah. But what have we found out in the last four days when we have war and conflict in Sudan, that's not enough for the UK government to provide safe returns or safe pathways and legal routes. So, what, so how do we explore and how do we fulfil our international obligations? Looking at framework and guidance, um, my specific area is in relation to queer refugees, LGBTQ plus refugees, that's where my, my specialism is. So that comes through the portal of particular social group. Knowing 1951 was even before the Wolfenden Report here in the UK in 1957, 10 years before changes in the law in 1967 regarding an age of consent of 21, clearly the framers of the Refugee Convention in 1951 didn't look at protecting LGBTQ people. But importantly, the courts here in the UK didn't even look at gender, at women, as being protected under the Refugee Convention until the 1999 case of Shah and Islam. So 48 years after the framing of the Refugee Convention did the UK courts recognise that women were a protected group under a particular social group under the Refugee Convention. It was only in 2006 that women who were subject to female genital mutilation, the case in Sierra Leone, were also protected under the Refugee Convention. We are quite forward-looking here in the UK courts because in 2020, um, the UK Upper Tribunal also accepted that somebody who's non-binary was protected under the Refugee Convention in the seminal case of MXM, gender identity. So we can see from the case law and the approach of the UK so far, we interpret the Refugee Convention as being a living instrument. The key case in the UK, which had a positive implication... Oh, sorry, um, Shah and Islam, of course, Lord Stain, and I, I call it the obiter breadcrumbs of the judicial table, said when he looked at the case of adulterous women in Pakistan regarding the inclusion of women under the Refugee Convention, said, well, also these homosexuals... Sorry, they say practising homosexuals. I don't know when I'm going to get the gold medal, but maybe one day... <laughs> But practising homosexuals, I, I look at my husband when I'm saying that, um, pra practising homosexuals due to their distinct status as being discriminated as a social group, sharing an innate and immutable characteristics. That means something that can't change or that can't be required to change. Innate and immutable may also be protected as a particular social group. Um, the, the seminal case is Suhanda Jane in the same year, um, Lord Justice Shaman um, uh, gave that judgment in 1999. And an uh, interesting Southampton Link story is that in 1998, when I went for my Inner Temple Major Scholarship interview, an interview I was slightly late, with, late for with my then boyfriend because we had the Inza Court Society uh, dinner at Rhinefield Hall the night before. And I was very, very late. And I came into the room and Lord Justice Shaman was uh, you know, chairing the panel. 
Um, and I had to talk about, you know, why, you know, working for LGBT rights or lesbian and gay rights was something which was important at the bar. But the, he constructed a continuum by which the UK court... So remember, this is 48 years after the UK entered the Refugee Convention. And we talk about Lord Panic in 1989 in a case called Bombessi regarding a Turkish Cypriot gay man. And clearly, Mr. Panic, as he then was, was acting under instructions. He informed Mr. Justice Kennedy that because practicing homosexuals can refrain from sexual activity, they are not protected under the Refugee Convention. That was the UK approach in 1989, height of the AIDS epidemic, a pandemic and height of Section 28. The UK government's approach to gay men is that you can refrain from sex. It's only when you have sex are you at risk and therefore you are not protected on the Refugee Convention. That's 1989. So we get to 1998, um, 1999, and the UK says we're going to start protecting gay men. But then, of course, and this is why this is not a party political lecture, we have the Labour government. The Labour government which supports LGBT rights, yes? You would all, you know, nod your head if you agree that the last Labour government was a champion. You're all looking cynically at me because you know I'm going to provide a bite to that. Well, in 2004, in, in a case called Zed, a case of a gay man from Zimbabwe, um, following the High Court of Australia case called S395, ad, um, addressing the plight of two gay men from Bangladesh, the Labour government, through the Home Office to the courts, introduced the discretion test. So in a series of cases from November 2004 called Zed, and then you have Amari, Ethiopian lessons, and then RG Columbia, which was my first case as sole counsel in the Court of Appeal. I was representing this young gay man from Columbia. It's accepted that he was gay, accepted that there were vigilante death squads which go around killing gay people and transvestites, as they were then called and prostitutes. And they accepted that if he was known to be gay, he would be at risk of such death. There was a psychiatric report which says that if he tried to conceal his sexual identity, he'll suffer a mental breakdown. Lord Justice Buckley said that's not enough. You know, he was able to be discreet for 13 years before he arrived in the UK. So therefore, he can go back to Colombia, have a nervous breakdown, and that still will not cross the threshold for reasonable tolerability. So that is the fact of the law under a Labour government. I can tell you as a refugee lawyer who's been working in the field uh, since 1999, but, but four times since August 2001, Labour was just as bad as the Tories when it came to refugees and asylum seekers. Yes, they've said that they will not support the illegal migration plan and they will get out of uh, Rwanda, but all politicians when it comes to refugees and asylum seekers are not saviours. And that, that's why it's so important to have the checks and balances of the courts. So, in, so then what happened, and I, I have to be careful about your time. Yes, OK, <laughs> this is going to be quite interesting. Um, so then what happened is in the summer of 2008, I was, I, I, I was sitting at my, my desk in Chambers, and I was given a phone call by some, uh, Sebastian Rock at the UK Lesbian Gay Immigration Corp. Um, they would represent, they'd been contacted by a young Cameroonian man who had been detained in Scotland and now was south of the border and need representation. H.T., as he, we call him, in the summer of 2007, it's a beautiful, warm summer's night in Cameroon. He goes outside into his back garden with his boyfriend, sees the, the moon and the stars, and it's very romantic, so the moment takes over him. He reaches over to his boyfriend and gives him a kiss. You know, it's in his back garden. It shouldn't be a problem, should it? The problem is his nosy neighbour saw him kissing his boyfriend. So the nosy neighbour starts spreading rumours. Oh, H.T. over there, he's a homosexual. And remember, this is a Roman Catholic country. So the rumour mill starts happening. Now, H.T. himself is Catholic. He walks back home on a, on a July day in 2007 from church, and the mob descend on him. They start calling him names. Then somebody uh, starts throwing stones, and then they have sticks, and they start beating him to the ground. The police come to the scene. You expect them to protect him, don't you? No, no, no. H.T., he's a homosexual. So the police end up beating him as well. He gets put into a hospital. Luckily, there's some Canadian Jesuit priests. The Canadian Jesuit priest said, look, H.T., no. And H.T. is a very successful businessman. He's got a carpentry business. He employs nearly 100 people, yeah? So he's, a, he, you know, he's not one of these economic migrants, which they stereotype, who desperately want to come to the UK. So the Jesuit priest says to H.T., look, you need to get out of here 
and we're going to get you to Canada. Now, unfortunately for HT, there's no direct flights between Cameroon and Canada. So he has to go through this little island off Europe called the United Kingdom. So he comes to the United Kingdom and unfortunately has a stopover for a couple of days. And then when he's going on his flight to Montreal, he gives his false passport. And guess what? It's a false passport. And UK Home Office recognises a false passport. And because he's used a false document to try and leave the UK, not leave Cam Cameroon, he's prosecuted and sentenced for 12 months for use of illegal ID documents. So he's then imprisoned, taken to Scotland, and then in the first year tribunal in Glasgow, they accept his whole story. He's got medical evidence of the perforated eardrum, all the scarring across his body. They accept that he's gay, accept his narrative and everything else. The Glasgow Tribunal is fine. The presenting officer in Glasgow says, well, wait a minute here, I've got this course called F, F in UK, it's a Strasbourg case, it's about the situation in Iran. Yeah, so I I Iran's no worse than Cameroon, and this was in 2004, the F in UK case, before, of course, the country guidance cases in 2005, which said that Iran is actually uh, a country where you'll find risk as openly gay men. But, you know, this is a Glasgow presenting officer who, in 2007, clearly hadn't got up to date with their case law. Um, and they, they said, look, you know, it's all HT's fault. Because if he hadn't kissed his boyfriend, the nosy neighbour would never have found out, and then he would never been ill-treated. And because the reasonable tolerability test was still live, they said, OK, and this is what the Tribunal on Appeal said, that because it's your fault that you got found out, you can go back to Cameroon and live in another part of the country. Yeah? So his appeal was dismissed. It said, you can go back to somebody who's been tortured, you know, not only by the mob, but also by the police state. You can go back to Cameroon and live somewhere else in Cameroon, and they'll be reasonably tolerable. Yeah? Then what happens is that he, he's told he's transferred from Dungaval, the detention centre, down south of the border. His Scottish lawyer says, we can't help you now, you find, have to find an English lawyer, which is actually technically wrong, but we'll go to that in a moment. And then nine, nine months out of time, I get that phone call saying, what do you do? That's what is wrong. How can, you know, that's what the, you know, the gut instinct, I tell all my pupils, go for your gut instinct. When something's wrong, trust your gut instinct, because nine times out of ten, you'll be right. How can we be sending back, as a country, people who've not only been identified as gay, but persecuted because they're gay, and tell them, go back to the country which nearly killed you and live somewhere else, and it's all your fault for not hiding yourself successfully? Yeah? So we went to the Court of Appeal in November 2008 and um, got permission, Lord Justice Ricks, uh, was, was on the bench, but then there was a jurisdiction problem. Because, of course, he, his first tribunal hearing was in Glasgow, and his appeal was technically in Glasgow. So my Scottish lawyer friends don't like me for this, because what we were able to find out is that the appeal to, from the first year tribunal, his Scottish lawyers were in Glasgow, but it was a video link appeal to London. So when we looked at the statutory operation, his appeal was technically heard in London. So the Court of Appeal accepted our, our, our argument and therefore we went to the Court of Appeal in London. In one of the, what I'm going to say is one of the most um, insensitive uh, judgments by the Court of Appeal, they introduced what is a cultural relativism test and they said that gay people should actually respect the social, cultural and religious mores of a country and therefore discretion would be reasonably tolerable. So Iran will kill you, Jamaica will rape you, Cameroon will kill you, and you as a gay person must respect their laws and their cultures in order to be returned back to the country of origin. Then in two th July 2010, the Supreme Court, and this is the binding framework case for all refugee cases, and we call it the Kylie Concert case because of this. So Lord Rogers at paragraph 78 says that just as straight men are able to, uh, I'm going to I, I always summarise it, just as male homes, heterosexuals are free to enjoy themselves playing rugby, drinking beer and talking about girls with their mates, so male homosexuals are to be free to enjoy themselves going to Kylie concerts, drinking exotically coloured cocktails and talking about their boys with their straight female mates. Now, the, the gay gossip column um, sort of said that before Kylie, it was Barbara Streisand. And then after Barbara Streisand, it was Kylie Minogue. And then it was Kylie. Now, 
Is Lord Roger saying that all gay men like Kylie? <laughs> of course not. Third, third, uh, third uh, um, track on the Aphrodite album is, you know, that's a test the Home Office should be asking you. No, trying to, Lord, what Lord Roger is saying is that we're all different and equal. You know, it's not about who we are, it's about how we express our identities. And it actually goes to the core of the Refugee Convention, is how would you be treated by the potential persecutor when you're identified? Either by your voluntary identification, your openness, or you're identified because you're nonconformity, your perception test. And that's central to the Refugee Convention. So the binding guidance is summarised by the Court of Appeal in 2017 in case called LC Albania. This is a case I was lead counsel in the Court of Appeal in 2017. Is this, and this goes to all refugee claims in the UK, so not just LGBT claims, all refugee claims. So are you gay or will it be perceived of gay by, uh, as gay um, by your potential persecutors? Yeah? So are you a political activist or will you be assumed to be a political activist because you can't sing the Mugabe chant song? That's a case called R.T. Zimbabwe in the Supreme Court in 2012. Do openly gay people have a well-founded fear of persecution in the country of origin? Why is that very important? In Nigeria, there's a country of 80 million people. Where are the out gay people? The 5 to 7% of the Nigerian population, statistically, we've accepted, even 1%. Where are they? Because of the climate of fear and the climate of persecution and the threat, the number of people will be open but very small. So what you have to look at is what happens when people are identified or are the warrior, the gay martyr, as the Supreme Court says. Because that's the analysis, not in relation to the general list of gay people. The third, uh, so, um, the third question is, will the individual be open? So my Jamaican lesbian client, SW Jamaica, the court up tri tribunal accepted that the genie had escaped from the bottle. Even though she knew that there's a real risk of curative rape or murder, she would still be open on return to Jamaica. She couldn't do anything about it. This is her very being. But the majority of people, if I, if I point a gun at you, Emily, would you run towards the gun or away from the gun? I'd duck. <laughs> okay, there's always one in the audience. <laughs> I've never had that. <laughs> well, the majority of us would run away. It's a fight or flight principle. So the majority of us will be discreet. And that's the, the residual discretion test. So the question the Supreme Court then says is that if the only reason for your discretion is personal choice or social pressure, which I don't understand, you know, like mum and dad won't like, like it, you get a few names, then you're not a refugee. But if you fear mum and dad not liking it and you fear the neighbours will kill you, you are a refugee. So if a material reason for your disc discretion is because of that, then you are a refugee. Now, the one great thing about the Refugee Convention is that it's an international instrument. So a lot of countries around the world look at our judgments and we look at their judgments, especially Australian, well, more, more likely New Zealand judgments and Canadian judgments are help, more helpful uh, than uh, Australian judgments. But we look at the jurisprudence around the world to see how we can be able to build our jurisprudence. So that's why the HA Iran test is used in Ireland. I've given training to Irish judges and also Norway, Sweden and Finland. And you can read an article called um, Jenny Milbank, 2009, From Discretion to Disbelief, because what happened before H.A. Iran, under the Labour government, is that say, we accept that you're bisexual, we accept that you're a lesbian, we accept that you're a gay man, but, and even though we accept that in Ethiopia or Iran or uh, Bangladesh or Pakistan your life will be at risk, we will find that you'll be re uh, discreet and that will be reasonably tolerable. So 98 to 99% of LGB claims, because it didn't apply to trans claims, because it's very difficult to talk about discretion with the majority of trans claims, because your, your birth natal certificates will not be in line with your gender expression or, or identity. So 98 to 99% of lesbian, gay and bisexual claims under the previous administration were refused solely on the reasonable tolerability discretion test. That's what we were doing to refugees during that time. So this is where the policy development came. So what do you do? I, just, I was scratching my head. I just started my PhD at King's in 2008. So what do you do when I went to a conference, an international conference, Chatham House Rules Apply, and somebody turned around and said, well, you know, I know what normal is. How do you prove gay? Okay. Um, can I ask for a volunteer, sort of um, somebody who self-identifies as a straight man? 
Yeah. When did you realize you were straight? Uh, probably when I was... Hesitation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no detail. He's going red. Don't believe him somehow. There's, you know, a narrative behind that. So isn't it a silly question? When did you realize you were straight? Well, we expect gay, lesbian, and bisexual people to realize when did they first realize they were gay, lesbian, and bisexual. Thank you, sir, for, for volunteering there. So the, the point is, it's not about being a specific identity. It's about being different. Because it's a difference which is the core of the persecution. Because if you were the same as your potential persecutor, you wouldn't be at risk, would you? Yeah? So it's a narrative of difference. And uh, that's the key issue. Because once you uh, discover your difference, is what political scientists call the group differentiated individual, you see other people like you. And usually it's a sense of joy that there are other people like you. But then what happens is that if you come from a country well-founded fear of persecution, you will have the recognition of stigma. Because you realise that people like you, by your family, by your community, by the people around you, don't like people like you. You know, the Adam and Eve rather than Adam and Steve. You know, the little noise. So this is a, like a, a flow diagram, because what I decided to do is create a model. I said, well, how do you prove a lesbian, gay, and bisexual asylum claim? You go through a narrative, not a uh, sort of a, a sheet of 40 questions to answer, but you go through a trigger questions to be able to enable the individual asylum seeker to be able to tell their narrative. And the devil's in the detail, because once you have stigma, you have shame. Because you feel bad about wanting to be killed by the neighbours, or feel bad about the religious imam saying that you will go to hell. Yeah? So different stigma shame is core narratives regarding the narrative, and then what makes a gay refugee? The issue of harm. So I created this model in 2011 called the DISH model, different stigma shame and harm. Started talking about it in 2011. The model was endorsed by the UNHCR in October 2012. And then the European Asylum Support um, Organization. Note that I never copyrighted it. Yeah, there's no money. You know, it's all free. Um, but the point is, it gave an alternative tool, a positive tool, to decision makers, not only in the UK, but globally, to be able to get the narrative. And 2014, John Vine, the independent chief inspector of Borders Immigration, because of the media frenzy after a Jamaican bisexual in Hasla detention centre, was asked, what do you like about a man's backside? Did you wear a condom or did he? Did he ejaculate or did you? These were questions asked to a Jamaican bisexual asylum seeker in Hasla, which caused Theresa May at the time, the Home Secretary, to decide we need an inquiry in relation to what is happening in the UK regarding lesbian, gay and bisexual asylum claims. And then John Vine, the independent chief inspector, uh, met me. I gave him some training regarding the DISH model. He recommended that the DISH model be used by the Home Office, and the Home Office had been using it since 2015. This is why I said about policy development. That as, as activist lawyers, you can not only litigate, but you can also have the opportunity to influence policy development. If you'd asked me, if I was sitting there 25 years ago in my Southampton lecture, would I ever be doing policy development with the Home Office and globally, I would have been laughing at you. Yeah? And the only reason why I'm saying this to you is that as Southampton students, the students who are here in this room today, do believe, hi Nina, nice to see you too, um, do believe that you can go out there in the world and influence global change. Yeah? It's very important because it's, you create the opportunities by, looking, by considering as a lawyer, how do we get over the hurdles which are being presented to us by the system? Because remember, you are part of that system. So if you want the system to change, you need to be able to affect the change. So let's look at now the Nationality and Borders Act 2022 and the gradual incremental change in UK border, uh, UK policy towards refugees. Yeah? As I said earlier before, that you, know, you couldn't be convicted of a criminal, for a crime in the UK for illegal entry because that was the law of the UK. And the UK government, through the CPS, through prosecutions of individuals in those small boats. This is what was happening in 2021, is that the CPS were told to prosecute the people who steered the boats in the Channel Tunnel. And the Court of Appeal in December 2021 said, no, you can't do that. Because the law, up to that stage, in December 2021, is that we only criminalise illegal entry. Because guess what, guys? It is not illegal to claim asylum. 
So what the Court of Appeal said is that an individual has the intention of arriving to the UK to either be picked up by the Royal Navy or Coast Guard or when they arrive at the shore in Dover to be able to claim asylum, then they're not committing any criminal act. Yeah? So they are, cannot be prosecuted. It is contrary to Article 31 of the Refugee Convention. Remember, we talked about criminal penalties earlier this evening. Yeah? So what does the government do? And this is the modus operandi of this government. If we don't like the law, we change the law, and then it becomes illegal. That is the mantra of this government. Yeah? The fact that our Home Secretary keeps on saying we have illegal, they're illegal, and they're criminals, and they've been illegal and criminals since 2018, false statement. They only became illegal with the operation of Section 40 of the Nationality Borders Act 2022, which came into force on the 28th of June 2022, when we made illegal arrival. We criminalised arrival. That's what we did. We changed the whole dogma. And interestingly enough, the lead case Mahmoud in, in March 2023, where the Court of Appeal upheld the convictions because of the change of the act, was a Sudanese national. Why is that relevant? Would anybody in this room say that a Sudanese national, as of today, is anything but a refugee? So we're now criminalising refugees. That's the current climate here in the UK. Let's look at other me measures. We're doing hierarchies, group one and group two. The majority of my clients, when they come to the UK, just want to escape. They come into the country, they get into environments where they feel that I can be me. Yeah? So they delay. They don't claim asylum at the arrival point in Heathrow. Yeah? So they take time. From the 28th of June 2022, anybody who doesn't come directly from their country of origin, so you've all got to be rich enough to fly directly from your country of feared persecution to London Heathrow. Forget if you're poor, yeah, and you have to travel and get agents. You have to come directly to the UK, and you need to claim on arrival. Only then, if you are found to be a refugee, do you get access to the full benefits of refugee status, including um, pathways from refugee status to nationality. If you delay, if you, do, if you come, well, let's, let's siphon off the, Ru the Rwanda Channel crossing boats. Let's say you come into the UK on a student visa, you take eight to 12 months, you realise that you like um, people of your same sex and you claim asylum, you're group two you will come under much fewer benefits in relation to your pathway into the UK, and you won't get nationality. You'll be kicked out. Because we don't want people like you. Because you're not good refugees. So this has been the law since the 28th of June, 2022. You then have the standard of proof, because we have what is called the reasonable degree of likelihood, a case called Sivakumaran in the uh, 90s, where Lord Bridge says... Look, when you look at refugees, you're looking at risk of life. So we're not going to use, clearly not using the criminal standard. We're not going to use the civil standard, the balance of probability is the 51%. In a case called Bataev in 2004, the Court of Appeal, and that's Lord Justice Sedley, says, look, if you have a car where there's a 1 in 10 chance of the brakes not working, would you drive the car? How many people would drive the car? I'm, I'm surprised that there are more, not more people. I mean, there are lots of people. I mean, I'm definitely not using the roads on my way back from, from this uh, campus. But yes, one in ten chance of the brakes failing, you wouldn't drive the car. So the standard of proof for asylum claims is less than 50%. There's some, be, some debate about that now. Since the 28th of June 2022, to prove that you're gay, to prove that you're a political activist, to prove that you've got a religious doctrine, you had to go to the civil standard. And then somehow the decision maker and the judge has to decide the entirety of your claim on the lower standard, the less than the civil standard, to be able to decide whether you're a refugee. OK, I'm worried about the time, but we're going to carry on. Particular social group as well. You've got, uh, the slides will be available after the, the lecture, so we'll talk to typical, typical barrister. OK, so Rwanda migration plan. That's Rwanda. Has anybody been to Rwanda? Have you, are you not all attracted to book your tickets to Rwanda now that Suella's gone to Rwanda? There's beautiful rolling green hills and those wonderful little hotels she's, she's just built from your money. Yeah? 120, 120 million, so James Eady said to the Court of Appeal only yesterday, the money's gone. Yeah? Well, we know from the Israel-Rwanda agreement between 2013 and 2018, we had something called chain reform, which what happened was the 
Rwandan government would stop individuals at the airport, so this was involving two Afghan nationals who'd come via Dubai, and then send them back to Dubai, and Dubai sent them back to Afghanistan. So that's chain reformer. We had a Syrian national who'd come from Turkey. The, uh, the Rwandan government sent him back to Turkey, Turkey sent back to Syria. Yeah? What did the divisional court say in December last year? Doesn't matter. Because what you have got, the UK government, is assurances from the Rwandan government. And you're one government and they're one government and we, we all sing Kumbaya because we believe in your assurance. That is, in summary, noting the time, the divisional court judgment in relation to the Rwandan migration plan. Yeah? But what we do know is in relation to the issues arising in the Court of Appeal, and look this through quickly, you have within the evidence, evidence such as is that when it came to the Israeli-Rwanda issue, UNHCR have said, and this is only the second time they've done it, they've made an unequivocal um, statement to say that Rwanda does not comply with its refugee convention standards. And the only time they've done this before was MSS and Belgium when they talked about the Greek government in relation to the standards in Greece. And also they did it on the stage one regarding Italy, but they withdrew it later on in, in the uh, litigation. We have issues regarding security personnel making nighttime visits to the detention centres. And this is all the evidence we had, and UNHCR was referring to this during this, this uh, proceedings. We're talking about issues, the grand chamber case of Elias. We don't need to show Article 3 real risk in relation to a merits review, what will happen to them to return, if we can show that the procedural mechanisms are contrary to Article 3, that the procedural guarantees aren't there. We know in Rwanda that the only decisions which were before the Court of Appeal were decisions which didn't give reasons for refusing asylum. We also know that there's a lack of independence with the judiciary. We also know there's a huge lack of training. We also know that the Home Office of saying that the IOM have given training to Rwandan officials is wrong. We also know that there's only 1,100 law senior lawyers in, um, uh, in, in Rwanda and only 300 junior lawyers. And guess what? 34 lawyers in the whole of Rwanda have refugee status determination training. And if you want to get a lawyer, the majority of you will have to pay, but they may be pro bono. So I'm going to, so now the interesting chilling effect is what Lord Panic said this morning. And this is the real chilling effect for all of us here in the UK. Because what Law Panic said is that the court should only be looking at what the contracting parties agreed at the framing of the convention. 1951, remember? So the conven contracting parties did not agree not to expel to a safe third country, Article 32. If that legal principle is accepted by the court of appeal, guess what? You as a woman, out of the refugee convention. You as a queer person, out of the refugee convention. Because you can't be a living instrument. Because as we know, there's no way in hell that you could say that the framers of the convention in 1951 except that gay people would be refugees. Because as Lord Hope said in paragraph 2 of H.A. Iran, we are correcting a historical injustice. So you can imagine that avalanche which will occur if that principle is accepted. And this is the FCDO travel advice for Rwanda today. And it's the same travel advice which was there in April 2022 in the framing of the Memorandum of Understanding. Homosexuality is not illegal in Rwanda, but remains frowned on by many. LGBT individuals can experience discrimination and abuse, including those from local authorities. Now, interestingly enough, the Home Office did not produce a single notice of intention to an LGBT plus individual. That's why they're not before the court. But we do know that the DGIE, the National Security Advisor, said we will not uh, look at asylum claims from those who, who are, uh, pose national security implications but also are unpalatable. Yeah. That was the evidence before the Court of Appeal. And then, of course, last night we had the third reading, 289 votes for, 230 votes against. What we will find with the Illegal Migration Bill is that as it goes to the House of Lords, there will be a battle. I was very fortunate to be asked to be an advisor to Lord Justice Etherton, Lord Etherton uh, when it came to the Nationality and Borders uh, Bill last year, and I've been asked to come on board this year in relation to that. But we do know with the Illegal Migration Bill, which is currently going through uh, Parliament, there is a declaration at the front of the bill saying that they cannot produce a Section 19 Human Rights Act statement to show compliance with human rights. So we already know that it's going to go into the courts because of declarations of incompatibility. 
This is what your taxpayers' money is being paid on for legislation which will clog up the courts for years to come. Uh, I'm going to give you that brief, and let's go to section Rule 39 measures. How much longer do I have? Okay, let's carry on. <laughs> but let's look at, t thank you, Rule 39 measures, that's really taken the political media storm. How dare Strasbourg stop the plane from going to Rwanda last June, last year? You know, those European foreign judges, what are they doing? We should be able to override them. Look at the facts. Between 2019 and 2021, uh, uh, there were 5,518 applications in entirety to Strasbourg on Rule 39. Remember, 47, still then, 47 Council of Europe countries. That's before Russia kicked out uh, uh, later on. Only 625 Rule 39. What a Rule 39 measure is, is that if an individual exhausts their national remedies, they go to the European Court of Human Rights. They say that there's a real risk of uh, immediate or irreversible harm, serious harm under Article 3 or Article 2. There are some Article 8 cases of private life in there as well. So in order to make their application effective, the Strasbourg Court says, OK, whilst we're considering your case, we're going to issue an interim measure. We're going to stop your deportation. Because it's a bit silly if you're arguing that you're going to be at risk of your life or torture to send you back to Rwanda while we consider your claim. You may be dead by the time it gets considered. So that's why uh, Rule 39 applications are granted. Now look at the UK. Between 2019 and 21, 180 applications, Rule 39 applications were made. In 2019, zero were granted. In 2020, two were granted. In 2021, only five were granted. Of course it went up in 2022 to 12 because of Rwanda. So it's not exactly a tool which the Strasbourg Court uses sparingly to say, no UK, you can't send people back to these countries. It's a very, very small test. And whatever they said about the media, saying we will override and we will ignore Strasbourg judges, the regulations which were introduced in Parliament yesterday make it quite clear, because guess what? We have active civil servants. Activist civil servants now. Have you heard that phrase? You know, I, I, I gave evidence to the Legal Aid... Uh, commission inquiry uh, at Westminster in January 21. And I said to them, look, I'm an activist lawyer, but you're activist politicians. Because no politician goes to Parliament without being an activist. Because they're not just there to apply the law, they're there to change the law. So how can they be anything but activists? So the issue there is, is that Strasbourg very rarely issues these Rule 39 measures. Parliament has made it quite clear that if, if the discretion is used by the Secretary of State, it will be used in a very, very limited manner. Yeah? Um, and I've given you the case law in relation to that where it started to become the doctrine of binding because, it was across, because it's not in the Convention. Rule 39 is not in the Convention, but the case law of the Strasbourg Court says it's got to be read in line with Article 43 because you can't have a Convention without teeth. And it's a basic premise of international law that you approach international law in good faith. Yeah? The, the, the doctrine of good faith, the, the Vienna law of treaties. Yeah? So you accept that the European Convention does bind the UK, so you accept to avoid an Article 3 or Article 2 breach, you will abide by those measures by the court. I can tell you as a refugee lawyer who's been working in, on cases in the Strasbourg Court, it is a very, very rare thing to be able to get granted. Yeah? Very rare thing to get granted. It's, uh, the only case which I've got it recently is uh, the Lebanese, um, sorry, the Anwar refugee case I've got on at the moment. So these are the principles and doctrine we have to look at to be able to understand and underpin. And whatever the politicians tell you on television, the activist civil servants have been able to convince our wonderful immigration minister, Robert Jenrick, and our Home Secretary that you have to, to rein it in. Yeah, because we do have international legal obligations. So let's look at safe routes and broken systems. It's claimed last night on Newsnight, you can see how up-to-date I'm trying to be, that there are 480,000 refugees granted since 2015. Uh, how many legal routes are there? No. We've had Syria. We were told 20,000. Anywhere near 20,000? No. We've got Afghanistan. I can tell you I work with an NGO based here in the UK, and we are dealing with Afghan cases because only 21 individuals from Afghan have been accepted under the Arab exercise in the past year. Safe legal routes. And then we have Hong Kong. And of course, Ukraine. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Why is it? Scratches his head, looking at my skin colour. Why is it Ukraine we open our 
our pathways to, but we don't open pathways to people like Sudan. You know, we had the Home Secretary yesterday morning on Sky News saying, oh, well, if they want to, or what, what about number two national safe legal routes? You know, case example, war or conflict. And what does our Home Secretary say? Well, they can apply through the UNHCR through repatriation. UNHCR very quickly put out uh, a statement saying, no, you can't, because you, the UK government, haven't said you're going to accept anybody through the repatriation pathway. Robert Jenrick stood up in Parliament yesterday afternoon and said, oh, don't talk rubbish. Um, I spoke to the Assistant Commis Deputy Commissioner of the UNHCR last week, and they said that they can do repatriation. Very quickly, Suella Braveman, our Home Secretary, went on TV last night on Sky News and said, uh, no, we can't do, but we're only really looking at British nationals. Yeah? And Yvette Cooper went on Parliament and said, oh, yes, well, we're looking at British nationals and family reunion. Didn't extend it to actual safe legal routes. So I'm going to tell you about a truism in a few moments to wrap it up. So we look at the number of people who cross the channels, yes, and we know Albanians. Albania is a safe country, isn't it? You know, it's part of Europe. It's got to be safe. You know, 45,730 people crossed the channel last year. 11,000 boats. Around 13,000 of them were Albanians. This year, in 2023, these are statistics that given on Radio 4 a few days ago. 5,530 persons in small boats, 173 small boats. That's Radio 4 yesterday morning. Albanians. I've worked with Albanian asylum seekers for years. 52% of Albanian nationals who claim asylum in the UK are given trafficking protection under the Trafficking Convention, refugee protection, or some sort of human rights protection. So either the Home Office at preliminary stage or our independent judges in the courts and tribunals accept they're refugees. In 2016, I did a case called DD Albania regarding a woman who's suffering domestic violence. That's a risk group. Female trafficking victims, a case called A, D, and D, A, A B, and D, D country guidance case. Last, on the 4th of April, the Upper Tribunal promulgated the determination of my, one of my cases on a young man who'd been trafficked from Albania. The hearing was before the Upper Tribunal on 23rd of February. It was accepted in 2018 by the tribunals that he had been persecuted. Yeah? And this is a revocation case. It's on the tribunal website. It was published yesterday. So, so those people, and there's other groups such as LGBTQ+, distinguishing a country guidance case on my call BF, and then others who have mixed ethnicity. Why do you think Albania is not in Europe? Fact. If it was safe, why are we worrying about these cases? Why aren't they in Europe? That's got to be the obvious question, if it's so safe. Yeah, Turkey is not in Europe, even though we were lied to in the Brexit. Sorry, I shouldn't be so political. Even though we were told through the Brexit propaganda campaign that Turkey is going to join the, the, the European Union, we know for certain that there are countries in Europe. I'm doing, guess what? Hungary and Poland. As an LGBTQ plus refugee lawyer, Hungary and Poland are unsafe for queer people, specifically Hungary. Hungary is currently being litigated against before the European Commission because of its non-compliance with the Charter Principles because of its anti-LGBTQ laws, specifically in relation to children. So we now have countries in Europe which are accepted by the European Parliament to be unsafe and refugee-producing countries. I'm currently dealing with the case of a Hungarian gay man. And these are the actual statistics now. Between 1st of January and 31st of March, where's Albania? 29 out of 3,500. What's happened to the Albanians? But we have the second group, which is Indians. Now, India is now the world's more, most populous nation, 1.3 billion. But I know of cases going to tribunal at the moment where Muslim individuals are getting protection because of the nationalist BJP. But forget India, look at the major countries. Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Eritrea, Egypt, huge political turmoil at the moment. Sudan, 144. This is before this week's troubles. What, can one person in this room, forget India, can one person in this room saying that none of those nationals are refugees? No. You can't. We accept that they're refugees. Even the UK... 12,000 cases in fast track because the, the Home Office accepts that those individuals from Libya, Syria, Eritrea, Yemen and Afghanistan, 85% success rate for refugee protection. 
I have a Yemen national, and she's, uh, she's told me I can speak about her case, who's a trans woman from Yemen. I'm representing her. We produced, we filled in the asylum claim questionnaire in March. There were 10 emails with supporting documents which we forwarded to the Home Office in time. We get then an email from the Home Office a week later. You have failed to file your documentation in line. We'll give you another 10 working days. I had to spend my Sunday evening busily resending all the documents, uh, 10 emails now, and then a week later I get an email saying, we, 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 we are acknowledging some of the emails you sent the first time. And then only last week did they actually acknowledge service and filing of all the other emails. Now, this is a trans woman from Yemen, and nobody can argue that she will be safe from Yemen. Trans woman from Yemen who has a lawyer, an experienced lawyer, who goes to the system of having these quite clearly incorrect administrative decisions from the Home Office through her application. Can you imagine what it's going to be like if you're unrepresented, you can't, sorry, you can't read English or understand English, and you're supposed to fill in this form to try and see if you can get refugee status? The system is broken. The system is collapsing. Because as I said a few months ago, there's 138,052 asylum decisions which are yet to be made. I see the day-to-day -day impact on my refugee clients because they can't do anything about this. I have clients who'd waited three years between registering their asylum claim and being called for interview. Is this the fault of the refugee or is this the fault of the Home Office? I'll let you answer that. Um, so we have all these applications, the Secretary of State said that they've doubled the number of case workers. We're seeing 12,000 claims going through the system. It's, cost, sorry, it's costing £6 million a day to house the 40,000 in the channel. What are we? But we do know that prior to the breakdown of the system, the statistics are from the Home Office in August 2021, 76 to 78% of asylum claims here in the UK were either granted by the Home Office on first instance, or granted through the appeal system. So the majority of people who come to the UK to claim asylum are genuine. The rhetoric of this previous Home Secretary, uh, uh, Priti Patel, and the current Home Secretary, Suella Braveman, and the Immigration Minister, that the majority of these individuals are economic migrants. The Home Office two weeks ago had to publish a paper saying we have no evidence of, these in, of the majority of individuals crossing the channels being economic. It was pure, political, unfounded, false statement rhetoric. They come to the UK because they have family or community connections. They have linguistic connections. And there could be other reasons. Working in the field I do, we've got what I call a historical deficit. We know that in the last month, Uganda has, is trying to look at passing legislation which will introduce the death penalty for lesbian, gay, bisexual people. Mr. Veni has actually sent it back because he wants more psychological support vis-a-vis -vis conversion therapy for Ugandans, like what they did in, in, in Ghana. And we also see the Kenyan government in the last week looking at introducing a bill regarding criminalisation. A lot of these countries had colonial laws from us. So where are they going to be refugees from the war or conflict area? And I'm going to stop with that because these are my three favourite words. Litigation, litigation, litigation. Welcome refugees. Thank you.